I always say that uh, when I've been working the country, it's about sharing your culture. It's about sharing my uh, connection to, to this country. You know, and I'm very, very proud to be able to do that, just to share a bit of um, Ghana country. So, Mani na Puri na Kuna Mi Nya, na Mani na Naran Rosal Kong, Mada which in Ghana Mi Nya, na Wangadi Mani na Puri Ga Mi Nya Chani, na Chu Yunga Gata Yaka Nandanya. So, what I just said is that welcome, welcome to our beautiful Ghana country. I would like to pay my respect to my eldest, past, present, and those emerging. But I also want to pay my respect to that we have some other nations that might be present here, to your eldest past, present, and emerging. Like I said, my name is Lawson Coleman. I'm a proud Ghana and Naranga woman with historical bloodline connection to Ghana country and Naranga country, <coughs> excuse me, which is on the York Peninsula. So I grew, grew up in a little country town uh, called Point Pierce. And, um, so, um, so that's where I uh, grew up. It was um, the 12 case from the from the nearest town. And um, that was one of my fondest memories growing up as a child because everybody looked after one. You know, everybody provided for the community. So I have a lot of good memories. But also I have told a lot of stories. Uh, for Aboriginal people, and Torres Strait Islander people, we are storytellers. And we continue to tell our stories, but um, but I also want to acknowledge the Ghana people as the protectors and the caregivers of the Adelaide Plain region, and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are spiritually connected and important to the living Ghana people today. I also want to acknowledge those that have come before us, who have opened doors, continually fought the hard battles in keeping their culture alive and strong today as we build upon the legacy today and into the future. Some may not know, but our land is the home of the great red kangaroo tanda. As we all know, the kangaroo never goes backwards. It always moves forward. And for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that's what we continually to do, is to move forward. Um, the River Torrent also I want to acknowledge um, the, um, the Ghana ancestral spirit Trabilki, which is the Ibis man. The River Torrens has been an incredible and part, important part of the culture and the history of the Ghana people for generations. Ghana are the original people on the Adelaide Plains, the area now occupied by the city of Parklands, called by the Ghana people Tantani, the Red Kangaroo Place. This is the heart of Ghana country. But people have migrated to these beautiful shores that we call Australia today. And I would like to acknowledge and recognize and embrace the true history of this country, a history which dates back thousands of generations. The very footprint of this country were those belonging to the First Nations people who are the traditional owners and are thankful for the community that we live, we share and we work together today. I would also want to pay my respect to the cultural authority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people throughout this country. I know we have one here and um, and that um, that are present with us here. And also non-Aboriginal people, you also, that are, are gathered here. And you could be from right across the um, Adelaide of South Australia. I know that this gathering is very special and important. We welcome you all here this, this evening. As most of you would have been have participated and involved in Land Care Association of South Australia. Um, and that it is a representative voice for community land care of in this area. And I know that it's your very first members call followed by the AGM. So the yeah, association plays an active part in supporting it and advocating and building a stronger voice for all land care. Through coming together, having those conversations that will continue through meaningful dialogues. 
We know that at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people right across this country, from the beginning of time, have been managing the land and culture and the environment. Land is fundamental to the well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The land is not just soil, rocks or minerals, but a whole environment that sustains us and is sustained by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and culture. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the land is the core of all spirituality and its relationship and the spirit of country. It's central to the issues that are important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Our ancestors' legacy will continue to live in the memory and the hearts of their generations. For First Nations people all over Australia, and we understand respectfully about cultural protocols and cultural respect for other nations. It's what we do, and we must continue with the utmost respect as we come to the traditional lands of the traditional people. But we aren't alone on this journey. We are traveling together with the guidance of our elders and those that are in leadership of their land care. Um, and um, we're finding our way of passing on knowledge to our young people. Myself and you also that are present here this evening have been back and trusted to shape, guide and lead this journey. These words are designed to turn into actions that will achieve real uh, great results and successful outcomes that will deliver on changing lives, not just lives in our environment and land, for not just today's generation, but for the next generation to come and the next. Our desire here today is to honour this in the best way that we know how, and that is to remain focused, understand, and listen to the words, the wisdom, and the integrity and the honesty of our elders and those that are in their leadership within your organisation, and but also in your family and your and to always stay true to the intentions and ensure that no meaning is lost, to have a desire and an energy to move forward today and into the future. Land, culture is the very essence of, of who we are, our identity and our connection to country. May our footprints on these ancient lands of the Ghana country and other nations remind us of creation and connectedness in our search to truth telling. In closing, in life we will experience many things. It will either give us great memories or it will really give us a great lesson. For me, I have experienced both. We will ex experience emotions, challenges, obstacles, etc. But it's how we deal with it that counts. I have no excuse big enough that can keep me from moving forward. And I know that you will be the same. I am living my passion. I have the felt fire in my belly and I'm shining my light and I will continue to speak my truth. But let me encourage you with these words. You have been positioned with a purpose, plan to follow your dream, to live in your passion and to stand in your purpose. We are all on a journey and we have the ultimate opportunity to share our ultimate gift to inspire, encourage, and to motivate others. And that's a powerful thing. You need to surrender to your greatness, your gift, and your calling. You are a generation with great potential that will lead you to bigger and better things. A wise old elder said to me a long, long time ago in the state of things today, he says, Ross, he says, your worst day of motion is a great day for your soul. He says, trust your inner spirit. It knows the way, and it will guide and direct your path. Santari, Yana, Kunta, Yata, always was, always will be. Gandhi. Natalia, thank you very much, and have a great time together as you share with one another. Natalia. Thank you, Tony Ross, that was wonderful. Um, I'd like to acknowledge you and, and um, 
the lands that we are on, and I would like to acknowledge that I live on um, Norunga land as well, so it's very nice to have you here tonight. Um, we'll get straight into the presentations. Um, Natalia, would you like to um, come up and introduce the speakers for us? We'll have three present three groups presenting tonight. Um, and we'll start off with Laura from the Upper Region Land Group. Um, and then yeah, we'll do a little bit of Q and A if anyone has any questions or anything like that. Um, after even people online. Um, yes. <laughs> so for people online, we are have spot. Fantastic. Hello, everybody. My name is Laura. I'm from Stir Upper Reaches Land Care Group. Um, I've been involved in the group since 2019, I think, um, where we went to the Strawberry Fair, saw some pictures of bandicoots and some lovely things, and went, oh, what can we do to get involved? So, give me my background is not anything in sort of land care, ecological, environmental. Um, but if you did have any questions that I couldn't answer, I'll make sure. I get the answers for you and um, get some emails out to you. Um, but Stay Up Reach is Land Care Group. So our catchment is broadly divine, defined as the um, upper reaches of the Sturt River. Uh, we've been operating since 1995. Uh, started with parents of the Upper Sturt Primary School uh, getting together, wanting to make a difference in the area. Um, excitingly, we've had four new people join our committee. Our AGM was on uh, Tuesday night, and so we had some interest when we presented some Bandicoot um, information, so that was really exciting, but otherwise we've been about eight strong for the last couple of years. Um, so pretty small group, but small and mighty. Um, and on the next page is... A picture of our most of our committee. So we all got together and took a photo, obviously looking at the wrong camera here, but that's okay. Uh, so I wanted to tell you a bit about the projects we've been working on and some success stories in combination because I thought our projects are what our successes have been. So has anybody heard of the Bandicoot Superhighway project? A couple of hands. Is anyone really, really involved? And will know way more than me and I would look silly up here. Thank you. If anyone online, please forgive me. Um, so the Bandicoot Superhighway project, essentially we're looking at, um, it's a community-led project, uh, aims to save the endangered southern brown bandicoot from extinct extinction by creating a highway of interconnected and suitable habitat through the Mount Lofty Ranges. Early on, we wanted to call it Nature's Corridor, but it didn't do well with the press. They like highways, so <laughs> that's a shame, but that's what it is. Uh, project includes community education and upskilling, monitoring and surveys, updating knowledge and prioritising and implementing restoration activities. Project partners include the Log Selg, so that's what we call ourselves, so that our reaches land care group, uh, Nature Conservation Society of SA, so they've delivered the project, Landscapes, Hills and Florio, Green Adelaide, National Parks and Wildlife SA, Uni of Adelaide, and Friends of Parks groups. Um, so where we're kind of at at the moment, it's come to an end of the pilot project, which was a two year project. Um, I've got some newsletters here, if anyone's interested in having a read of newsletter one and two, which has some great information. But excitingly on Tuesday night, uh, two things were released with the Bandicoot project. One being the Habitat Management Guidelines. So this is a really great resource about how we can best support Bandicoots. Um, and unfortunately, my husband and back and I'm looking because my little four month old baby's down and waiting for the stream. <laughs> um, we did just get an email copy of this. So if anyone's interested, we can absolutely get that circulated. Um, along with this one was also the uh, impact guidelines. So lots of really great information that came out of it. Lots of really good um, learning. And it was never designed as a project that was done after this period of time. It's it's always looking forward and uh, what we can do next. So little old self, was, it's quite amazing that we did get involved in this big project. It was 10 years in the making, lots of very dedicated people um, and quite substantial funding. So it's about $500,000, um, 250000 that self was able to get from a government grant and two hundred and fifty from, uh, sorry, that's probably the wrong one. Foundation for National Parks and Wildlife. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so really, really fantastic uh, project. There's been lots of great community involvement in that one and being community led a lot of um, doing what the community would like and, and going, approaching them and saying, what can we do to help you learn more about this um, and support those benefits. Another sort of uh, offshoot of that one, which was many, many years in the works, was the Understory Plants for Bandicoot Habitat cell publication. So we have this is our third publication as CELG, and the other two is a fungi guide and a um, fauna guide, an animal guide for our local area. So a simple guide developed to help landowners in the Sturt River catchment and nearby areas identify plants often found in areas where benefits are seen and some of the plants form an important part of their preferred habitat. So very similar to the habitat management um, in a lot of ways, but it, it just uh, was finishing off a project that had been a long time in the works for us and our organisation. Um, as well, And so that is due to be uh, printed. We're just waiting on a bit of finalising final touches and then we'll get that printed <laughs> and electronic copies all ready to go. So that was really exciting for us. Not sure, Michael, how many years have, have been in the about 12, I would say. Oh, three days, that many. Okay. <laughs> three days, that's my look, Yes. Um, as well as some really exciting community events. So uh, we've been working on uh, lots of public talks, working bees, um, as well as getting out to information stalls and uh, local events, which has been really cool. I just wanted to talk a bit about some challenges and solutions that we've kind of come across <laughs> in our group. Uh, so really looking at the challenge of momentum for projects and keeping that going. So um, I guess the biggest one for us, it has of course been the Burn to a Super Highway project and it's coming to the point where, okay, the funding stopped and there's some people who have been really dedicated and really motivated that are looking like they're going to take a step back and we go, okay, well, how are we going to keep going? How are we going to keep going not only as sales but also these big projects, this, all that, and these quite ambitious projects that we've been working on? Um, there have certainly been some considerations made for this within that project. So there is still um, the NCSSA, uh, people are continuing to look for funding for that one. Um, the steering community is certainly still alive and active doing, looking into what we can do. The impact report is obviously such a really great resource to look for, um, look forward to what, what we did, so what we can do next. Um, as well as really just involving others and, and making sure that it's known that anyone else can get involved and um, that's possible for people that have interest, um, as well as really just getting people to come along to our different things like public talks and uh, volunteering events. So we recently had Nature Festival where we ran a couple of working bees and had really poor turnout. So it's been really tricky to try and get people involved and in coming along to, to things that, um, I guess not even just that we're kind of asking for help. So in the case of a working bee where we're saying, please come along and help us um, and what we're providing is knowledge and you know, a bit of fun in the sun. Um, even things like our public talks where we've gone, we've got these great speakers coming along. It's just been quite tricky to get people to come out to see us. So I guess we're trying a few different things to engage people and our solutions have been things like uh, are there, could we offer some native plants to give to people to take home? Could we um, advertise in other ways and, and sooner than we normally would? So getting articles out in the courier and those sorts of things. Um, no real sort of solutions that I've kind of seen in my time. It's, it's a bit hit and miss. I guess at AGM and the release of the, um, the Bandicoot information meant that that was quite a good turnout on Tuesday night. That huge amounts of work went into that and uh, it was from all different avenues. So I guess no real answers from me in terms of solutions. Um, and then lastly, shared values and considerations from us or specifically from me. I thought that it was really important uh, to have opportunities for people with various capabilities to become involved. So some themes that we're seeing from people um, wanting to sort of either join our committee or um, had a few people say, I'd love to get involved, but 
I've got kids, so I can't make meetings and things like that. And that's kind of where Michael and I are at the moment with our little baby in the back. Um, so just making it known that we can be flexible and we can um, support people as well as in my background as a speech pathologist, um, I do a lot of work with people with disabilities, namely aphasia. Um, so how can we support people that don't always have those abilities and, and looking at physical things as well? Um, and children too, we have quite a good relationship with the school for how we can get them involved as well, um, which sort of leads into the next, maintaining connection to community. So uh, landholders, our local schools, uh, we're quite close to the upper skirt soldiers memorial hall so how we can keep that relationship and each support uh have that support for each other and then um i guess lastly from sort of like a committee perspective and our kind of uh long-term volunteers letting them focus on their strengths and what they're interested in and um really supporting them to do what they want to do rather than kind of steering us all in the same direction if it's not an interest of, of everybody letting them have a bit of creative freedom to do that, which I think is really great about volunteering. Um, but yeah, did anybody have any questions for me? Laura, how many um, uh, properties are involved in Hollyville Corridor? Ooh, good is question. Lots of different um, private properties as well as the national parks, isn't it? Yes, and I'm trying to think of the stats, and it was a, quite a large number mm. of uh, how many. I will get the impact report to you, sure. and that will have that information mm. quite clearly, because it was actually quite a lot more than I had considered. I was just going to ask you, um, considering that you do have quite a bit going on in life as well, <laughs> um, what what do you get out of it like this? What, what keeps you coming back? That is a very tricky question. Um. I guess it's it. It's been really beautiful for um, us and having that connection to our community. So we grew up in Teacher Valley, both um, my husband and I and moved up to the hills um, and really just that sort of community engagement kind of thing has been really lovely because um, when we do go to the working bees and we have to pull out weeds so they and go, oh my gosh, why are we doing this? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's a big animal lover still, I suppose, but that's a hard one. Thank you. <laughs> I will think on that. There's just one question online. Um, they're just asking whether planting guides available, whether there's a planting guide available online, or where yes. is it available? Uh, it, and that would be the Bend if you have a plant management. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. Uh, it will be on the, uh, available through the Bend Superhighway websites and um, national NCSSA. You go to the cell website projects tab in about as long as it takes me to put it on there, it'll be on there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what was that? I'll repeat right? that. What's the URL? S U R L D dot org dot um, yeah, or it's Google it's our, it's our, it's our, our bridge to Lanka group or so. Yeah. So is the understory plants within the habitat on there as well? It will be, yes. Yes. No one uh is definitely available digitally, <laughs> but you, I would love to become a member to get a digital. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And all of the year, thank you. All three publications available. Um, yeah, great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. And next up, we have Peter Bird from Friends of Wake. Yeah. Here representing Friends of Wake Conservation Reserve, we uh, support the University of Adelaide owners of Wake Conservation Reserve, um, uh, mostly doing uh, restoration and conservation works in the reserve. Um, um, coincidentally, the uh, reserve next year is as it's oh, sorry, the, the parcel land that was donated to the university by pastoralist Peter Wack um, has its centenary next year. So we're just about 100. Although the reserve's only 30 years old. Been there since the start, Peter? It is pretty much, pretty much. I wasn't a foundation member. I think I probably joined six months uh, later. But uh, the, the reserve was created about 30 years ago. The Friends formally uh, about um, 22 years ago. So I was there pretty much from the start. So I worked at, um, at Wake Campus, which is why I, when I walked up the hill sort of behind, 
discovered grey box of grass in here, which is the same as where I come from over in New South Wales, from the farm that uh, I grew up on, had grey box of grass in the roots. And which meant I fell in love with it and now spent most of my life there. So yeah, the, the reserve has got mostly grey box grass and woodland, which is a, a nationally endangered plant community, um, which occupies again yeah, about seventy percent. But it's also got uh, red gums. Uh, up to you, we go. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's us. We're about five k's from the city centre. The closest remnant we're saying uh, to, the, to the city grey box grassy woodland, mm -hmm. um, but we've also got blue gums and red gums and a band. Well, yeah, a band of um, she oaks are going through that, that follows uh, a band of quartzite through the reserve. Um, we've got um, 210 native plant species, uh, most of the biodiversity is sort of in the, the low knee height, so lots of grasses and all these of these and daisies and kind of nice things. Lots of pretty yellow ones, pretty pink ones, pretty blue ones. I don't have enough time to show you all the other colours, but lots of colours. Uh, conserves lots of reptiles, um, all that species of mammal, we've seen 90 species of birds, and all of the usual suspects of lovely things that make it a great place to work when you're a wildlife junkie, as I am. So um, it's all not beer and skittles. We've had a fair history of disturbance there. The um, uh, agriculture really didn't get a hold on. It's too steep and rocky for agriculture, but um, there's been quite a bit of tree clearance in the area. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. So, um, very few um, French roots will have a hands hyson of their patch, but we're very lucky. <laughs> um, this uh, that's the reserve at the top of the view there. Um, so it's it's called quarry at Mount Osmond. We've got about eight quarries in the reserve. Um, and so that's the view from Mount Osmond looking across the freeway down the front um, at the reserve at the back. There are many more trees there in the reserve than, than in that, that image. Uh, we've had um, the sheep, the research sheep flock used the reserve for grazing for a very long time. Uh, it's all fenced, and so a lot of the reserves have been overgrazed. Yeah. And they put lots of fertilizer on there, all of which are fantastic things for uh, for weeds. So we get lots of lots of weeds, which occupy a vast amount of our time when we're trying to restore the reserve to about 130. Weed species. Oh, we're ripping through now. I can't go back. <laughs> I can't go back. Um, that was us, though. That fleeting glimpse was the Friends of Wake Conservation Reserve. It was about 60 of us, uh, 60 of oh, wow. them, most of the time. Um, at times, more on list. Um, and they, they, that's what we sort of basically do. We uh, assist the university to uh, in the conservation and restoration of the reserve, we encourage community use and enjoyment. And we promote the reserve for research and education. Oh, I think we did another big jump, did we? I can't remember what it was. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. I've got 50 slides anyway. So, <laughs> just, um, so one of the uh, our nemesis is feral olives. We spent a vast amount of time, the university spent a vast amount of time doing olive control over the last 30 years. Um, it, they originally occupied probably 70 or 80 percent of the food, which is the after the sheep were removed, they came up very thickly over the reserve, and we've got them down now to about four hectares of untreated olives, but it's been you know, a very, very long and expensive uh, run. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody who's had any little olives will know they're a very um, persistent bastard. Uh, thank you. That'd be great. Uh, we, we do lots of other weed control, so we're mostly tackling weeds which haven't reached the ecological limits in the reserve. Uh, everything from hand to weed weeds through the chainsaw, but we do been a fair bit of time doing chemical control on some of the nasty weeds in the reserve. Um, this is sort of guides our weed control um, activities. Uh, our weed control calendar tells us what and how and when we should be controlling various weed species so uh, so as we don't miss, miss out any of the sequence and uh, we try to get uh, particularly isolated populations uh, extinct or they go to see. Thank you. Um, and recently, we've uh, adopted a doctor patch, uh, much like the, uh, the Trees for Life Bush Care program, where individuals adopt a patch. Um, targeting individual weeds is not always a perfect uh, undertaking when all you're doing 
over some of the reserve is making space for the next weed. So what we're doing here is encouraging people to adopt the patch and then remove all of the weeds off that patch, much like the uh, fish care principle. Um, the other side of uh, restoration is revegetation. Thank you. And that's Grant up in the top corner. He's our victory beach guru. Thank you. Who developed the plans? Um, plans are based on on the um, floristic patterns in the reserve uh, with the uh, beach communities, which themselves are based on on various physical attributes in the reserve. Thank you. That are all mapped. Um, Starts with seeds. There's lots of pretty seeds in the reserve. Thank you. And then we uh, collaborate very closely with Verbrae TAFE. We've got um, conservation land management students down there, and we work. I think last year we had about eleven groups in the in the reserve doing collection, collecting seed, and propagating plants, and planting out stuff, as well as um, taking for weed control and things as well. So it's one of those lovely collaborations where. We think we're teaching them some stuff and they're doing some great things for us. And thank you, next one. And so we grow uh, one or two thousand juice stock um, at the Herbray Tafe Nursery every year. Uh, we then plant them out and we do it with direct seeding, but um, we've got in 2026, we were planning to direct seed a couple of hectares uh, mechanically. Thank you. Uh, we do some veg monitoring. We've had photo points out there for a very long time since the start. Uh, they sort of they don't photo points don't tell you very much about what's happening in the other story. So in the last few years we've been uh, monitoring on hundred square meter quadrats around each of the photo points, uh, looking at the scent cover of all the native species present. Uh, and we do we facilitate gear control that we have for the last 12 years and may not do that much longer, but um, basically that's Andy there. He's been coordinating our gear control with it. So in the last 12 years, we've taken out about 400 fellow yeah. deer out of the area. So that's on the reserve and on the two adjacent properties. So I'm sure he's coming in and doing that. But um, it's something come again, a pretty much regular back. Um, and that's Clint in the top. Water. Vince, our, uh, our civil engineer, who uh, does all the uh, trail work. So we have post COVID, we coincidentally put up two people counters um, at either ends of the reserve at the time, just at the time that the COVID lockdown was happening. We're not sure how many visitors we had before then, but post COVID, we're getting about 50,000 orders a year going through the reserve. So it's that was, um, off the guards. Um, we do quite a bit of invert as well, so we, we produce walking brochures and uh, trail um, invertive signage and stuff, and we've got a trail app as well. Mm. We do lots of surveys of other stuff to uh, track what uh, changes might happen in the future. Thank you. And just to finish off, this is basically what um, we've been doing in the last um, two or three years. We're up around 6,000 hours a year, which is equivalent of three full-time equivalents in volunteer effort, most of about half of which is in um, restoration stuff, and then the rest is scattered among various other things. So I'll kind of leave it there, I think, and uh, invite any questions. Thank you. I should get into the discussion. Uh, very heavily guarded, a very heavily guarded secret. Um, I'll give you the password later. <laughs> it's, it's rather difficult to find. In fact, um, it's immediately behind Wake Campus. So there's a couple of entrances on Hartley Grove. So you drive up right through the campus to the end of Hartley Grove. You can come in off Hillside Drive, Hillside Road, Springfield. Um, or you can come in from the top off the old um, Alwata Road. Around the middle of the door. So, if you don't want to walk a very steep hill, which you can start at the top and walk around the top where all the stuff is. Yeah. So, yes, and there are maps online. Sorry? Are there maps online? There are. There yeah. are. So, if you go to your friends on the wait, it's open for post COVID. So, Google it and try it. Again, 50,000 people already know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much uh, support comes from the 
to be towards uh, the training screen. I look at the reasonable that we can sort of uh, manager that we can sort of deal with, and uh, actually it's very good, very supportive. Um, the university has a smallish budget to manage the reserves, so we um, you know, seek grant monies to help us, and um, and we think all the people that work in the reserve as well via the university. Um, we need more than the initial work that you've got. So, um, and yeah, yeah, so look, uh, we've got a good relationship with them, but you know, it's not their core business, probably. So, and in terms of you know, the effort, the friends group would do 95% of the management of the reserve. Yeah, could you tell us more, a little bit more about uh, your direct seating plans? I feel like it's not such a common approach for friends and parks group. Oh, no, so we, we go in that engaging so that you know, seating, uh, and, and yeah. that back basically we've um, started the process we've started uh, to spray down to make the patch a, a quite you know, degraded area. Uh, we acquired an extra 20 acres from um, the uh, Department of Transport about 20 odd years ago, uh, which had all been cleared pretty much, the, the cleared bits. It's either cleared or olives, and so uh, we decided that you know, 20 years on, we have been using um, cattle to sort of crash graze it to hopefully bring back a bit of stuff. But then we thought, well, nah, let's have a crack. Let's um, let, let's uh, you know, intensively direct seed an area. The catches you need, you know, 20 kilos of seed per hectare, which is maybe fairly. I worked out. I sat down a, a way that. I found out that um, small flowered wallaby grass, I don't know if you like to assume of cetacean, um, a kilo of seed has got two and a half million seeds in a kilo of seed. And that, that'd be one of them. They say our common wallaby grass. We've got eight species of wallaby grass, but that's sort of our big lift that. So, yes, we're going to need to see. So, there's not a on the sprout you see at the moment. Can we talk later about help? <laughs> oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> There's a question back here. Sorry, no? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, the university sort of decided they needed to go through a sort of a con contractual process. And so mm -hmm. uh, up till now, we've kind of done it all, uh, done all the sort of the interacting, done all of the monitoring of the populations, the closing of the reserve, um, the liaison with the shooters and whatever. And it's all, it's all happened for nothing for, for 12 years and with not really a lot of gear. But um, yeah, so they, they've kind of decided that, you know, it's a bit of a risky thing. They went to a risk and legal and it's sort of, it's all been um, a bit more, it's, it's going to be a bit more formalised, but at a cost, at a quite a large cost. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering if there's an opportunity across the network to to the government a bit harder to create care groups. Um, I used to work for Biosecurity SA, so they're the guys that basically um, are, you know, do all the deer stuff. Um, they shot 8,000 deer last year. Um, they're now using thermal for all of their, they've just eradicated or in a very glass gasp of eradicating pictural kangaroo often. Thermal helicopter shooting is an absolute game changer. And here, apart from built up areas like ours, uh, where they won't be able to shoot, I mean, they're doing Mount Bold and places like that. So they're, they're shooting vast numbers of deer now, a whole lot more than they used to. So I'm kind of expecting deer populations to, to be brought down to some lesser level over the next um, three or four years, I would think. Yeah, and they're, they're always affected with problematic. But if everybody was in it, then it's sort of really easy. But the, the, the difficulty is you need high power rifles. I mean, we we run up against um, you know, Springfield, um, and but we can still shoot within 50 meters of houses. Then all of our shooters use um, suppressors, um, silencers. Um, and so, it's, uh, till now, we've had no dramas with it, but, you know, and the universe is sort of being on board pretty well. So, um, it's possible. All right, we might have to leave the questions there, but thank you very much for bearing with us.
first. Um, so I'm, we're going to hand over to Eloise now, um, who is from the um, Southern York Peninsula Land Care Group. Um, so just interrupt, just yell out if you need me to stop at any point or if you can't hear. Um, my name is Eloise. I'm the secretary of the SYP Land Care Group. I firstly want to acknowledge that today I'm presenting, I live on and presenting on Gurunga country and the traditional lands of the Narunga people. And I pay my respects to the Narunga community, elders past and present, and acknowledge the significant ongoing relationship to country. Today or this evening, um, we do a lot. So I've, I've tried to collate it into a very brief um, presentation. A quick history of us, uh, a couple of our key projects and the opportunities and challenges uh, that are facing us um, in the next however long. Our group has been around now for over 30 years. I don't know the exact date off the top of my head, um, late 1990s, um, a group of people came together to form SYP Land Care Group and our membership has remained steady at about 35. We are also a registered charity, so we need to maintain membership level um, to have that status with the Charities Commission. And really um, our group, has lots of area of in areas of interest and focus that are very much member driven. We all have our kind of pet projects and passions that we bring to the bigger group, and then we find ways that we can work on them and get them off the ground or keep them running. Um, York Peninsula is really quite vast in its geography, um, and our focus is as far north as Port Clinton, probably not much further than that, but then all the way down to um, Dilba Gurunda in a national park. And we've worked closely um, with other community groups um, throughout the peninsula as well on a lot of our projects. Um, a big one in recent times has been the Osprey platform installation, which there was recently a, a viral video of a, a chick on a platform, not on York Peninsula, but on the West Coast. So it's quite timely as well. Um, our group was involved in the program or the installation of uh, platforms on York Peninsula. We found, well, through ob our observations, we found that between 2014 and 2016, there were no remaining breeding pairs on York Peninsula. Uh, so we established uh, the Eastern Osprey Recovery Program, which became an official plan in 2020 working with the NRM board um, and state government and other groups to look at ways to yeah, return, return breeding pairs to the peninsula. And to date, we have been successful in installing six artificial platforms. I think there might be one more since, since this information. And since 2019, seven Osprey have pledged um, from those platforms. That map there on the right, left, is of a monitored bird that fledged from Port Clinton that we were able to track all the way down to Kangaroo Island and it, they've set up its life on KI um, and a couple of the a couple of the nests do have cameras monitoring birds and things. So it's been a um, really wonderful project to be a part of. And subsequently, we were nominated for an SA Environment Award, which we didn't win, which didn't matter. <laughs> but the um, criteria was that a group or an organisation had worked on, had produced something significant um, and was successful because of the mobilisation of other groups as well. So we weren't really able to succeed in this without the support and work, working with other groups, a couple of which I will mention my name, the Adrosson Community Shed, who actually built the platforms um, at their little shed over at Adrosson, these amazing structures, the Friends of Osprey Group, which are working across South Australia in the uh, Northern New York Landscape Board, um, you know, really were, were fundamental in, in helping us achieve this. And it started as a bit of a brainchild, our former president, 
the late Kent Trelaw, you know, just happened to notice that there weren't these birds and then it really, it snowballed into this massive effort. So it was, it was really wonderful to see it acknowledged all the hard work of all the people um, who have contributed to seeing the birds return to the peninsula. Uh, one of our other local projects in is Millagawi, located in Millerton, also known as Dumflat. It's to the west of the town there, you'll see on that map. Um, and really it's been a focus for a couple of reasons, but particularly because the Casarina Glauca swamp oak um, invasion, I guess, has been really significant for a long time now. And it's whilst it's a native Australian um, tree, it's not native to South Australia and it's really um, threatening um, the river red gums in particular that are located around that area. So it was as part of the York Peninsula Council managed plan, the management plan of the area, um, the priority has been to remove, excuse me, remove these um, as many as we can, I guess, uh, around the area um, and to revegetate with other more appropriate vegetation, I guess. And we have a group of volunteers every week that go and basically, yeah, chop down the swamp oak and working pretty hard. Um, the other school groups go in and help and it's really a regular, a really regular ongoing thing um, that the community are involved in. And since then, the space is really used a lot more recreationally. There are cultural days, um, nature festivals and things like that. So it's a space now that's really being actively used by our community as well. And just out of interest, a lot of our members are local history buffs as well. So this is that area over the years, the coloured um, picture to the left or on your right um, is from 1992. The black and white at the top is from the 70s and the um, one down the bottom is actually 1956. So it was, I guess, a bit of a wetland area once upon a time. Um, that, that Milagawi area. So it really has yeah, transformed over the years and was always a recreational space um, for people to use and enjoy. So I don't know the date of this one, but this is, I guess, an example of what our volunteers are grappling with, um, but they're doing a really, really wonderful job. And close by is the Militant Fauna Park, which we are, we are the co-caretakers of. Also, its official name is the H.J. and Brian Cook Native Animal Reserve, which was bequeathed by the Cook family to the community. So we, we co-caretake um, with, the, with the council and we look after, there's uh, emus in there, kangaroos and wallabies, um, which we help. Uh, take care of and we've recently been successful in accessing some grants to undertake a feasibility study to expand the park in particular to reflect another local project, uh, Mana Bungara, which is a rewilding effort on Southern York Peninsula, reintroducing native species such as the brush tail betong. So it's ambitious, but it would be kind of cool to see those uh, animals in the park, perhaps through a nocturnal house. Something we're kind of, you know, seeing, testing the waters, how far could we um, really take it? Um, so yeah, we get the chicks in there at the moment, uh, emu chicks at the moment, and it's a really popular spot. No official kind of tours or anything like that. People just drive past. If you've ever been to Middleton before, you'd probably be familiar with it. It's right there as you're entering the town. Um, you know, people go and look at them. The emus are happy to come right up to the fence and say hello. Um, once upon a time, members would go and pick up people from Port Julia off the ships there and drive them back and show them the, the native animals in the park. So it really has been a point of interest for a long time. So we're hoping to kind of rejuvenate that a little and connect it more with the Milagawi as, you know, a real kind of access space um, for the area and showcase the type of work and um, beautiful environment that we have. A few opportunities and challenges, I guess, that are on our minds um, that we talk about as a group. So one thing 
and that's a priority is our coastal access and management. So a lot of our members are involved in um, the Treasure Cove down, down the bottom end as well. Um, a lot of our yeah, beaches and, and those sorts of coastal areas and how they're being managed um, and looked after. Bush camping and free camping is a bit of an issue these days, particularly since it's post pandemic as people are getting out and about in nature. We're starting to see a lot of um, movement to our beaches and even just locally where I am at Waralty, a lot of the shorebirds and nesting birds have gone, you know, lots of food covers and red cap stents and those sorts of things. They've disappeared since people have returned. So how can we best kind of, you know, help people enjoy the environment, but not, yeah, to the, to the detriment of our local species. As well, our access to natural spaces, and like uh, the first presenter um, talked about this as well, you know, how, how people can really get into the environment and enjoy it in an accessible way. We have, I guess, an aging population over here, so it would be, you know, really good, even our members, you know, how they can be a part of spaces and enjoy them and contribute and things like that that are safe and risk-free and or low risk and things like that. Certainly our invasive species, species management, we do a lot of roadside weed removal and stuff like that. It's just an ongoing thing all the time. One of the big things we're applying um, for money for is, you know, just getting a lot of these things out so that other things have a chance to flourish. Of course, um, grants and the work required, so, you know, we lament as well that volunteers, you know, are harder, getting harder to come by, but also a lot of groups because they aren't sustained by volunteer numbers, have to close or amalgamate. Um, because of, I guess, maybe the work that is that is starting to become required to, to operate. So while there might be, you know, a lot of grants available and things like that, everyone's quite time poor. I think that's a pretty common theme across a lot of groups in the community and the environment. And as well, you know, for our group and a lot of groups in our community, how we're succession planning and looking after groups so that they can continue into the future. I am only recently, I've only been secretary for a few years and there's a lot of data and records and things like that, that I guess are going from person to person. And that I know that it's a, an important, um, it's really important for understanding all the work that everybody's been contributing. So I'd, I'd really like to see it looked after, you know, how is it best looked after and how can how can we do that? So those are some things that um, are, on, are on mine and our group's mind. We aren't on social media yet. That's something we talk about too. Um, but if you would like to reach out, we do also have a native species, a native flora guide. Um, if you're interested in, um, please reach out. It's in its fifth edition, I think fourth or fifth edition and yeah I think that might be it for now. Thank you very much Eloise that was wonderful. So can everyone hear me again um, online? Yes right. Um, so thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end of our uh, three wonderful presenters. Um, so we'll get straight into our AGM. Hopefully this will be the, the quickest and seem most seamless part of the evening. Um, but I did want to give just a couple of um, updates from Lanka SA um, that might be of interest to your, you and your groups. Um, so two, two separate things. Um, we've just launched the Landcare Awards, um, which will take place in about May next year. So they are currently open for nominations. Um, you're allowed to nominate yourself and your own group. Um, I know Landcare is sort of shy away from that kind of recognition often, but um, we would really like to see as many groups nominated as possible um, so that we can really recognise all your hard efforts. The second thing is um, we've just launched partnerships with Arbor Green and BioGrow. Um, so members, member groups and individuals with uh, both of those businesses, uh, sorry, with us, are able to access the discount to those businesses. Um, so there's a bit more information on our website or give me a call or 
or an email um, and I can tell you a little bit more about them. Um, but I know a lot of our groups already use uh, the green in particular, um, so that might be a particularly interesting one to you guys. Um, so yeah, from, from there, I think we'll get straight into uh, AGM. So I'll hand it over to Sarah Barrett, actually. Make sure, make sure they stay on. <laughs> yeah, so please start going there. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I'll hand it over to Sarah who will come up and introduce herself. Um, and so I'll just bring up her um, agenda and things. Nobody go anywhere. <laughs> Quickest AGM ever. <laughs> um, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, I don't want to dig into time too much because I'll really getting things up on the screen there. I just wanted to um glasses on so I can see. Thank um thank Rosalind for the wealthy country and also um to thank the uh, presenters that we had. Uh, Laura, Peter, and Eloise uh, for our first members forum, which was great, really inspiring and enlightening. There was themes and challenges there, which um, we'll take away, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, it's really thank you for, for putting yourselves out there and doing that. Um, I also just very quickly and briefly, I, I uh, my name's Sarah Barrett, I'm the chair of uh, the Nature Association of South Australia, but I also just wanted to put some of our spot to um, say good day. Um, so we have uh, Sean with us tonight. Uh, Sean's our ALT representative. Hope I don't miss anyone here. Lara, I think he's online. Lara Tilbrook. Um, Jack is here. Uh, John Chester is here. Jerry is here. Have I missed anyone? I'll just change it back so we can see it. There's Lara. <laughs> Lara. Uh, but yeah, we're a, a small but um, small but large, I think. I think dynamic, I'm laughing at. That's what uh, my husband said when he's coaching the netball, being more dynamic. Um, but yeah, look, we are strive to do good things. Uh, we're supported by some pretty amazing staff in LE and Natalia. Uh, and also here tonight, we have Kate Winslow, who's our. Um, I guess financial manager who um, works for us uh, in a contract capacity, but he was done with the Yeah, look, there's lots of things I could probably say. I think I've said quite a bit in the, um, the annual report, which um, hopefully you guys have all read and digested, but there's a little bit of a piece there. Um, okay. All right, you make some Just to briefly sort of reiterate some of the um, achievements in there, I guess. Um, I just probably wanted to start off by saying that I think um, the last year that we have, um, I'm just incredibly, um, I just have a feeling of gratitude, I guess, for it because we've, we've done a lot. Um, we've had um, uh, Natalia join us at the um, well, halfway through this financial year, I guess. Um, and we've also um, been working with uh, our state government, our care for our care package, uh, and in delivering that, and that's been a, a pretty enormous effort, um, but also an enormous opportunity as well. So that's sort of been our major focus. Um, also, just wanted to highlight that we've really worked hard at trying to strengthen our Indigenous engagement um, with NASA last 12 months and I think that's really um really starting you know to hit strats. Um, we have an Indigenous engagement subcommittee in Lassa. Um Lara attended the Biosteaks conference I think in CAMS earlier in the year. Um, and we also supported the 25th anniversary of the first Indigenous protected area I think declared in South Australia um, at Epibana earlier as well. Um, and I just taking a bit of liberty really to also move on from what's in the annual report, which is sort of signal towards what's happening uh, in, this, in the land care space in South Australia, sort of moving uh, into the next financial year. Um, Ellie just mentioned that we've uh, just launched the land care awards for 2024, and we're planning towards an awards event, uh, probably in May next year, uh, likely. Um, and hope you can all come back and enjoy that. 
Um, so, and also work on getting your nominations in. Uh, we've also begun work, this is a pretty significant one, we're, we're moving on to the next phase of our three-year uh, funding, and a new phase, I guess, of three-year funding through the National Lake Care Network. Uh, and that funding supports us to operate as the fee body for Lake Care in South Australia. Uh, it uh, goes towards our staff and um, a, a lot of the, I guess, operational work that we do. And so we're just sort of putting some of the final touches, I guess, on, on that. The paperwork will still come in. But, uh, you know, that, that's really a significant part of, of what we do. And our involvement in the National Land Care Network um, gives us a voice through at, at the higher levels, I guess, at the wider levels, more strategic uh, voice for land care um, Australia-wide. Um, also, just to highlight that we have, through the Care for Land Care, been working with a number of different uh, insurance providers to try and find an insurance fit for Land Care South Australia, and that's one of our, our major goals out of that funding. Um, and really, that's about making it easier for our land for them to sit on and do the job um, and be able to uh, have what they need in terms of. Uh, you know, being safe and also to have that support behind them as they're working. Um, I think that's really about all. Um, again, thank you to the committee. Thank you to Ellie and Natalia and Kate for everything that you do and the uh, invigoration, dedication and enthusiasm that you bring for Lane Care. Um, I also just wanted to um, Especially shout out tonight to Jerry Butler, who is going to be stepping down from that for me. Um, Jerry, I tried to write you a card earlier and I was at a bit of loss to find the right words um, to convey my gratitude to you for everything that you do and have done um, for Land Care in the state, Land Care uh, nationally, uh, and also for myself personally. Thank you very much. Without further ado, I guess we can begin with this. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to our um, item two, which is Apologies and Proxies. Apologies to the Canada, Thailand, 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 and for we have a number of processes still, so um, quite a few there. Um, if you were here last year, you would have uh, if you've read, read the bigger package of the minutes of the last meeting, which uh, I guess is the next thing on our agenda. Uh, we actually had sort of two AGMs in a way. So we, we had the first one. In our constitution, we have to have a certain amount of members come for AGM. At our first AGM, which is actually here at the Archibald, we didn't get enough people to represent the groups. So we held a uh, AGM online the week after. Uh, so there's two lots of minutes uh, <laughs> in the package. Uh, the first one, because we did have a little bit of um, last night, but probably a little bit less formal. Uh, and then we also um, had the individual AGM uh, the week after as well. Um, but tonight, we've got our forum, I think, that we needed. Which is amazing. Thank you to all of you for participating tonight uh, to be here and, and be part of this. So I'd like to um, move the motion uh, to confirm the minutes from the previous AGM. So I've got one here, the 8th and the 15th of November 2022. Anybody who was there? Jerry has um, offered to second that motion. And sorry, I didn't actually look at the computer, but there are people online as well. Um, uh, so all those in favour of giving a motion of uh yes, the last eight minutes. Any dissent? Speak now or um somehow be in contact with me if you're online. <laughs> <laughs> um also uh the staff have done a marvelous job again of preparing our annual report. Um I really encourage you to read it. Um there's some fantastic work, so much work that goes in um, over the year. There's some um, updated stats that um, Ellen started to produce last year and our membership, um, which 
grooming and also highlighting um, the major projects that we've had over the year. I think I've probably said enough, and I did say that we were having a good AGM, so I will move the motion um, that we endorse the annual report for 2022 2023. Thanks, Sean. Uh, everyone in favour? Thank you very much. Uh, we also, as part of the package, had our financial report for 2022 2023. Yes, by Kate. Um, Kate is here tonight, um, and I will, uh, before I um, ask to move the report, ask if there are any questions that anyone had related to the report. <laughs> You can't see her online, but she nearly ran out the door when I said that. <laughs> it's pretty comprehensive, and I do invite you, if you do have any questions um, at a later time, please uh, feel free to seek us out as well. It doesn't look like we do. Um, so if you're interested in moving forward, um, Jerry, would you like to hear? I'll, I'll move the motion. So for people online, Jerry has moved the motion for our financial report for the year ending uh, June 30, 2023, be accepted. All those in favour? Again, any dissent? Please sing out. Thank you very much, everybody. That brings us to item six on our agenda, which was the election of the general committee. And uh, I think we're going to ask Kate if you could um, please take over as uh, leading us in the election of the people. I'll stand down. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't part of my. <laughs> that we will start with John and Jack so they've come on to the committee since the last AGM so if I could have a signal from somebody that would move that they are on the committee yes Yep. <laughs> Laura, 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 Laura moved. Second, they're all in favor. Yes, are all. Anyone not in favor? No. And now to uh, Sarah. Sarah. Oh. <laughs> um. So Sarah's office is still a chair, and he's still standing. So I would like to ask the to first nominate. Absolutely. <laughs> Can I? No, <laughs> And everyone else, if they'd like to cast their hand up, oh, right? If they are in favor, please. And everyone, yes, equally. And anyone who is not, please. Then we'll see. Welcome to our new chairperson, Sarah. Give it up to you. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll just maybe um, update people that. Um, so, yes, John and Jack. Uh, didn't quite get in at the last AGM, but they've been on our feet some time, so we're, we're just endorsing them. Uh, but we also have returning um, Sean and Lara and John. Uh, sorry, no, just Sean and Lara. So, uh, sorry, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> However, um, there is opportunity um, for new members to join a management committee. Uh, as I said, we're we're small and dynamic, um, and we meet. Uh, once a month, uh, generally, uh, stretch it out maybe a little bit more in between times. And we do uh, also have a number of different subcommittees. Um, we're going to have a subcommittee set up for the Landcare Awards, for instance. Uh, we've got our Indigenous subcommittee. Uh, and we're also looking for people with skills, even if uh, 
you have skills in um, you know, resource management or project management, strategic planning, that sort of thing. So for those who have all those skills help, and uh, even if you don't want to join the committee as such, but you feel like you might have something to contribute in, in that way, then um, please um, let us know and come and talk to me. Um, that's about it. So we're off to general business. And um, if anybody has anything they'd like to raise at this point in the meeting. online. Well, thank you everybody. Um, thank you so much for being a part of this tonight and also for all your work um, in whatever big way or little way, which is probably bigger than what you think way, um, that you contribute to main care and um, generally look after our state in general. Thank you very much. Um, here uh, at the Archive, uh, we have the opportunity to talk and um, share conversation, maybe stay for a meal tonight, and uh, I'll be looking forward to that. But I'd also like to thank you to everybody online uh, for, for sticking with this and um, and being part of the, everything tonight. I did also want to circle back to, to Ros really quickly, and I've left my notes over there, but I was madly scribbling while she was um, giving the welcome to country because she had some gems in there. And I think one of them was, there's no excuse not to move forward. And um, I'm going to take that away tonight and um, and I'll just buy my intro going forward. So thank you. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Um, particularly you guys online for holding with us while we were having a few technical difficulties. Um, yeah, so, so Natalia's just reminding me to let um, everyone online know if you've got any follow-up questions or anything you'd like to know a little bit more about um, to just email Natalia or myself um, and we can pass you on to the, the groups that presented earlier this evening. So thank you everyone online. I'll say goodbye to you now. <laughs>